welcome to our webinar today. Um, thank you for joining us. I'm Laura Rosick. I direct the Center for Southeast Asian Studies here at the University of Michigan. Just a little housekeeping. Your cameras and microphones have been disabled, but please throughout the webinar today, submit your questions via the Q&A function and the monitor can will address these the questions as she is able. And there's also live captioning for the duration of the event. This does not always transcribe accurately. We'll have a few announcements today uh, and introductions, and then a 10 minute presentation by each panelist and have a moderated discussion with Dr. Elisa Paradis. Our co-sponsors today are the International Institute, the Department of Asian Languages and Cultures and the Donia Human Rights Center. And of course, we'd always like to acknowledge our gratefulness for the funding that we receive from the United States Department of Education, National Resource Sending Center Title VI grant, which funds this and many of our other activities. This is our first event in our lecture series for winter of 2022. Our next one will be uh, Friday, February 11th. Um, Heather McLaughlin from the University of Dayton, Dayton Department of Ethnomusicology will speak on music and incitement to violence. Um, Anti-Muslim hate music in Burma and Myanmar. And just please note that will be back at our regularly scheduled time. And so I'm really happy and excited to introduce our roundtable today on the place of waste in Southeast Asia. Um, we have assembled, and Dr. Paradis has actually assembled a really exciting panel of um, panel talking to us today. Uh, Tamara Soma is an assistant professor in resource and environmental management from Simon Fraser University. Um, she is also the research director and co-founder of the Food Systems Lab. She conducts research on issues pertaining to food systems planning, community-based research, waste management, and the circular economy, much of which is based in Indonesia. Her work is featured in both academic and public-facing publications, as well as global media outlets. Dr. Leah Zani is an anthropologist, author, and poet based in Oakland, California. Dr. Zani researches and writes on the social impact of war and has released two books, Bomb Children, Life in the Former Battlefields of Laos and Strike Patterns, Notes from Post-War Laos. She has conducted human rights research with academic, museum, and development organizations, both nationally and internationally. Previously, she served as a researcher with the Human Rights Center at UC Berkeley in partnership with the Nobel Prize winning Mine Advisory Group in Laos. Von Hernandez is the global coordinator of the Break Free from Plastic campaign. He is a leading and multi-award winning Filipino environmental activist whose career has been marked by more than 20 years of campaign leadership, strategic planning, organizational development, and management. The work he does with the Break Free from Plastic campaign is featured in the 2019 documentary, The Story of Plastic, directed by Daya Schlossberg. His activism was inspired by experiences growing up in Manila, where Hernandez watched as incinerator plants and their attendant air pollution surrounded his community. And then finally, Dr. David Biggs is a professor of history at the University of California, Riverside. His research focuses on the ways that human, historic human interventions, such as public works, works construction, as well as destructive actions such as war, have not only reshaped landscapes, but also produced legacies that often continue to play in envir international environmental and developmental politics. He's the author of two books, Quagmire, Nation Building and Nature of the Mekong Delta, and Footprints of War. Besides these book projects, his essays have applied these approaches to related issues such as chemical weapons histories and cleanups, international river basin management, and military base transfers. And we're Excited to welcome back uh, the moderator, uh, Elisa Paradis, who is an LSA Collegiate Fellow in Anthropology here, and will join our faculty as an Assistant Professor of Anthropology this fall. She's a sociocultural anthropologist with, with research interests in human environmental and metabolic infrastructures of trade, and has put together this panel for us today, which again is a really exciting and multidisciplinary group. And with that, Alyssa, I will, I will um, have you take over and um, run the panel for us today. So thank you so much, everybody, for being here at the University of Michigan and talking with us today. <laughs> 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Rosek. And welcome, welcome, welcome again to our illustrious panel of speakers. We're so excited to have you here, even if virtually. Our only regret is not being able to meet you in person in Ann Arbor. But um, again, my name is Elisa Paredes. I'm a postdoc and rising assistant professor here at U of M in anthropology. Um, and I'm sure you're all, everyone here is excited to hear from our speakers. So without further ado, let me hand the, uh, let me just say that the order of presentation is we'll have uh, Mr. Von Hernandez first. We'll have Dr. Tamara Soma second, uh, Dr. Leah Zani third, and Dr. David Biggs uh, fourth. And then we'll open up for 45 minutes of a moderated discussion. And again, uh, feel free to put in your questions in the Q&A at any point in time. Um, so with that, let's, um, let's please welcome Mr. Von Hernandez. Thank you, uh, Alyssa. And, uh... Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good evening. I'm uh, actually uh, calling from Manila and I'm um, happy and privileged to be part of this uh, uh, panel today. Um, I would like to share my screen. Uh, Hold on. I hope everyone can see that and let me set my timer because I tend to go over time. <laughs> anyway, uh, Bon Hernandez, that's my name. Um, I'm co global coordinator of Breakthrough from Plastic. It's a movement, it's a global movement that is uh, now present in uh, more than 160 countries worldwide. We started uh, this movement in 2016 uh, in the Philippines uh, with you know, uh, about uh, two dozen uh, organizations. Uh, but since then, uh, the growth of this movement has been quite phenomenal. We now have more than 2,500 uh, member organizations representing millions of uh, supporters worldwide uh, who support uh, vision uh, for a, a future uh, free from uh, plastic pollution. And as, as you can tell, the focus of my presentation will be on plastic, even if you know that, that the general theme is uh, about waste. The Breakthrough from Plastic Movement uh, members agree, uh, uh, share a common vision. Uh, and more importantly, we have a shared strategy, which uh, uh, essentially constitutes uh, several key pillars. Uh, uh, number one, it's about uh, changing the dominant narrative around plastics, because there's a lot of misconceptions and myths uh, when it comes to this issue. Uh, it's also about changing corporate behavior, uh, and, and both from the supply and uh, demand side of the equation. Um, uh, since the, we've identified that as one of the key drivers uh, for this problem. And it's also about promoting solutions. And in this case, the approach that uh, we uh, adopted is encapsulated in what we call zero waste uh, or, or um, mainstreaming the idea of uh, zero waste programs and approaches in cities because that has been the dominant, uh, shall we say, uh, uh, battlefield or terrain, you know, where this uh, 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 contradicting or uh, clashing narratives uh, uh, take place. And of course, part of our theory of change is that in order to uh, win uh, this um, uh, vision, uh, we need to be working in uh, synergy with other movements, for example, the climate movement, uh, human rights uh, uh, groups working on environmental justice, uh, labor, uh, and so on. Uh, I think uh, just to kick it off, uh, while the focus of my presentation will be most in plastic, I, th uh, I think this is quite common. Uh, uh, if you look at the waste composition uh, of, uh, for example, that you find if you do waste audits, I've been doing waste audits uh, uh, in my uh, uh, work as a you know, toxic uh, campaigner or activist uh, in the past. Uh, uh, and typically, uh, especially if you look at Southeast Asia, this, uh, folk, this one is about Philippines, about 50% of the waste stream is really organics, right? Uh, organic waste. Uh, and, and then the others are materials uh, like plastic, paper, glass, uh, rubber. Uh, and also, I think I wanted to use this slide to emphasize that, you know, the waste is really a human invention because nature doesn't make waste. Uh, uh, everything is, you know, uh, cycled back uh, into the system. But uh, when humans start to making synthetic uh, materials, uh, particularly plastics, yeah, then uh, you know this problem has grown uh, uh, over the decades, over, the, over through the years, 
and it's really the uh, act of mixing all this stuff together that renders it waste. You know, uh, waste is a verb, it's not a noun, right? Because if you separate the different components of uh, the waste stream, you find uh, uh, useful uh, uses. They are actually resources, right? So waste being the flip side of resources. Focusing on plastics, um, because this has been a growing component of the waste stream as uh, societies in this region, in Asia, and also other regions grow in affluence. Also, the waste generation rates, particularly synthetic uh, uh, materials, uh, are also equally growing, and plastics are being the, uh, the one most aggressively that we see in aggressive expansion. Uh, this is a uh, graph based on a study done by scientists in the University of Georgia, which for the first time tried to, you know, uh, uh, tried to track, you know, the beginnings uh, of the problem. Uh, or even though we know plastic production uh, uh, happened much earlier than 1950s, that was when this thing was uh, uh, started to be documented. Uh, and from 2 million metric tons in 2050, uh, we now around 9 billion metric tons right, uh, uh, globally. And uh, scientists and academics have also uh, found that a significant portion of all the plastics ever produced since then have ended up in landfills or dump sites, 12% uh, incinerated. And, and this is the most important part, less than 10% has actually been recycled because we hear about recycling all the time. And we bought into this narrative that, you know, when it comes to plastics, recycling is the answer. As consumers uh, and individuals, uh, we feel good, you know, when when we we separate our recyclables, uh, uh, thinking that the problem is being sorted or being solved. But uh, uh, the reality is actually far from that. Um, and and if you look at the recycling uh, rate, uh, it's this is this comes from a World Economic Forum study. This graph, it's a different. Uh, percentage 14 percent but look the important thing i'd like to highlight here when it comes to recycling is the effective recycling rate which is actually even lower right it's uh actually about two percent right by effective recycling we're talking about uh, bottle to bottle recycling right uh, it's not like uh, you you uh, convert a plastic uh, uh, product into uh, uh, into textile for example or park benches or or roads, which is uh, kind of, you know, uh, down cycling. Uh, and that has a lot of limitations as well. So uh, really the effective recycling rate is just uh, very small. And whatever is down cycled eventually and ultimately becomes uh, wasted as well in the process. Uh, I, ha I had to cite this issue of recycling because one of the things that, uh, that uh, is also coming out there is that when we talk about Marine plastic pollution, which is a key driver for the you know massive public awareness that we now have over this issue. Uh, typically, uh, the countries of Asia and some Africa identify as the top sources of uh, this problem, right? China, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, maybe because of, you know the extensive coastlines, uh, but it also suggests uh, 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 implied in this uh, kind of uh, narrative is that these countries are. Uh, have are lacking in waste management systems, modern waste management systems, or uh, waste infrastructure, or worse, that uh, the citizens uh, of uh, these countries here mentioned are, are irresponsible. Right? They don't know how to deal with the, or manage the waste, which is why uh, many uh, civil society organizations and, and even in our movement are really uh, outraged by you know the implied uh, messaging behind this. Uh, uh, behind this narrative. Uh, it ignores for a fact, for example, that when you talk about uh, 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 waste management infrastructure and you say uh, what these countries need, the solution to plastic pollution is we need modern waste management in China, in Southeast Asia. Uh, it's actually uh, in effect, you know, by doing that, you're transferring the model of what we already know as a linear uh, uh, economic or linear society model. Uh, which most of us follow uh, now, uh, most societies follow now, and has contributed or led to the climate crisis as well as the waste crisis, right? And essentially, it's all about uh, converting resources from nature uh, into into waste, right? Uh, and then then comes waste, the waste disposal uh, industry as your hero uh, and from an extra extraterrestrial 
perspective, I just have to say, it would appear that the sole function of uh, human society is to convert resources into, into, uh, into waste. So, uh, so when you talk about transferring uh, uh, in setting up modern waste management, it's really about transferring this model, right? And we need to move away from this model. We are to uh, um, avert climate uh, catastrophe uh, and also waste crisis. The countries identify the top sources of uh, plastic pollution also ignores the fact, you know, that a lot of the waste that's uh, ending up in the ocean are actually coming from the industrialized countries in the West, the US, Europe, uh, Australia, for example, this is a community in Indonesia uh, 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 that's been receiving uh, uh, tons of, you know, uh, plastic waste from the US uh, and from Europe, right? So you have an agricultural community uh, uh, that overnight has been transformed into a dump site, you know, to take care of the so-called recyclables coming from uh, the US. They're shipped as recyclables, but they actually ended up being dumped. Uh, in communities such as this one in Indonesia. I'm just reminded, you know, farmers, this is a farming community, now uh, farming plastic <laughs> instead of, you know, uh, food. And in fact, uh, we used uh, that research uh, a couple of years ago uh, to push for a change in the Basel Convention, which is international uh, treaty governing, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, movement of passengers waste from which the poor countries, and we did that we did get the amendment to restrict or at least have some more restrictions about this type of waste trade. The other thing that's uh, that, that narrative of, you know, countries of Southeast Asia being the source of the problem ignores is that uh, a lot of the waste that is produced here are actually produced by multinational companies, you know, who in the attempt to capture uh, the markets uh, or class the lower markets uh, in, in, in our region, have introduced this plastic sachets or multi-layer packaging, uh, single use, single serve plastics, non-recyclable, difficult to manage, you can't do anything, they're not collected, that's why they typically end up in, uh, in beaches or the oceans. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm running out of time, so I will not be able to share, uh, show uh, everything uh, in my presentation today. Uh, but uh, another uh, false narrative out there is that cleanups will solve the problem uh, because, you know, we've been doing cleanups year in and year out, problem keeps coming back. And that's because, you know, the tap uh, continues to uh, 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 produce more and more of this problematic uh, uh, plastic. One of the things that we have been doing in Break Free is doing a waste audit and, a, and we introduced this concept of brand audit, a kind of citizen science participated in by volunteers from our different countries. And where our volunteers try to document, you know, the, uh, who's, who's producing all this plastic waste that's uh, uh, ending up in the environment, spoiling nature. And we consistently identify these companies, Coke, Pepsi, Unilever, Nestle. These are our typical top polluters, you know, and we've been doing this for four years in a row in order to drive, you know, the issue of accountability because it's not a consumer issue problem mainly. It's not about, you know, uh, uh, it's not a local government. It's, it's really about pointing a finger at who's responsible for perpetrating this crisis. And these are uh, the multinational companies. So uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, may, I will probably need to stop there because I've exceeded my 10 minutes, uh, Alyssa, but I'll be open for questions later. And maybe I can share some of the uh, recommendations and uh, uh, solutions that we're putting forward as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Von Hernandez. I'm sure we're all very eager to hear more uh, from your experiences, especially what you mentioned about recommendations and solutions. So we'll absolutely make a note to bring that back up when we open up for discussion. But for now, uh, let's please welcome um, Dr. Tamara Soma to speak about her research. Sounds good. Can everybody see the presentation okay? Yeah, I hope so. Okay, perfect. So, pagi. I'm, I'm actually I'm gonna turn my timer on, just like Mr. Hernandez. Okay. Selamat pagi, salam damai. Um, greetings of peace, everyone, and thank you to the panelists and the organizers of this conference, especially Dr. Alisa Paredes. I'm calling in from the unceded ancestral and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. 
here in Canada. And today in 10 minutes, I will try to highlight a few key points from my food waste research in Indonesia. So um, today I want to dedicate this talk to my fellow Indonesians who passed away in Louis Gajah, West Java in February of 2005. In Louis Gaja, decomposing food and organic waste in the landfill generates the greenhouse gas methane, um, especially in the open dumps uh, of Indonesia. This becomes a ticking time bomb, resulting in landfill fires and explosion. And 143 people, mostly waste pickers, and their families, including children, died to a massive landfill slide that was triggered by methane explosion and also rain. And in fact, a village located one kilometer from the dump was also buried. And so I dedicate my work to them. Now, today, there are three main themes I will cover about food waste in Indonesia. And the first one is the growth of the supermarket revolution and the distancing process that result in waste. So I'm going to talk about that theme. The second is the concept of gifting versus ridding and the role of class and income in determining who bears the burden of managing and absorbing food waste. And then finally, I will briefly cover the rise of packaging waste. And this is why I'm so inspired by Mr. Hernandez and how it has disrupted what was once a closed loop food system in Indonesia. But first I need to establish why it's important to understand food waste as an issue in Indonesia. The reason being is that when I was uh, doing my PhD, the common assumption was that, well, food waste is not a non-issue in lower income countries. And this was actually uh, written in FAO reports stating that consumer food waste is an issue for richer countries, while in lower income countries like Indonesia, the issue is predominantly food loss. And this is due to poor agricultural practice or lack of technology or lack of farmers knowledge. And I will say that this assumption is wrong. And only last year did UNEP, United Nations Environmental Program, finally acknowledge that consumer food waste is actually an issue as well. The first is that in Indonesia, we are faced with a diet transition. The transition is characterized by increased consumption of wheat, high protein energy dense food, convenience food and beverages. And this change in diet entails that the amount of food and type of food products consumed will have a bearing on consumer food waste. The second is the supermarket revolution. Countries like Indonesia are frontiers for supermarket development. And with the rise of supermarkets, there is a corresponding decline of traditional food markets in Indonesia and a wider variety of imported foods, stronger marketing that pushes over consumption and more packaging. And the third is rapid urbanization um, and a decline in farming, which means relying on longer, more complex global food supply chains, which has implications on the potential increase in the generation of food waste along the supply chain, as well as the associated packaging. And the fourth is growing middle class. So studies have documented that there's a growing number of middle to upper income groups in Asia um, with highly consum consumptive and westernized lifestyle. And studies have shown that middle class population in Asia will demand more food varieties, more meat, more energy, and more resource. And the fifth reason is distancing, which is a growing disconnect with values around food, which I will explain later. And finally, there is the problem with the disconnect in the waste infrastructure, which cannot deal with the influx of modern food packaging. And this means that the burden and the impact of rotting, stinking, decomposing food waste is felt more, especially by the poor and the marginalized who often live near open dump sites. And so my study took place in the city of Bogor in the province of West Java, Indonesia. Bogor is part of the greater Jakarta region and has experienced rapid population growth due to proximity to what will be the former capital a city of Indonesia, Jakarta. Some of you may have heard that Indonesia is moving the capital city to Kalimantan, uh, maybe you know it as Borneo, because Jakarta is sinking, uh, which is not good. <coughs> so let's talk about the first thing, supermarket revolution. So the supermarket revolution um, in Indonesia started in the 1990s with economic liberalization. And as supermarkets average sales grow, there is a decline in traditional retail. And as noted by one of my interviewee, uh, previously supermarkets were the domain of expats. And now the price difference is actually not that much when compared to traditional market. This is also known as price wars that supermarkets do to compete with traditional markets. <clears throat> 
Now, many of the traditional food in Indonesia, traditional food infrastructure in Indonesia are called buy today, eat today infrastructure. It encourages small daily purchases, less stocking up, it is seasonal because it's primarily local, and it does not promote stringent aesthetic standards on produce. But this is very different than supermarkets that now dominate Indonesia's landscape. Marketing practice such as beli satu gratis satu or buy one get one free promotes overbuying, and also stringent aesthetic standards is part of the standard operating procedure. So supermarkets also hold a lot of power. And so they can cancel contract with farmers on very short notice. And this also results in waste upstream. Another aspect of supermarket is what is called um, in consumption or discard studies as distancing. So according to Princeton, distancing is the separation of primary resource extraction decisions from final consumption decisions. And distancing result in more obfuscation, um, opportunities for exploitation, wastage, and a lack of transparency. And so there's one aspect to distancing, which is called spatial distancing. Um, this is reflected, for example, in the longer food supply chain. That's the spatial aspect. But then there are also studies pinpointing. Uh, there's also studies, um, uh, sorry, there's also the, the other aspect of mental distancing. So like what you see in this picture, and this I took these pictures when I was um, going with my participants, research participants, and um, where mental distancing is where people lose the connection um, and starts to value food. So these practices are actually common in supermarkets where if people don't want the food that they were actually, you know, thinking of originally buying, they might just kind of like put it wherever, like the case of these two um, meat. Um, and so these, these uh, meat products will be wasted because it has been out of the refrigerator. And so these types of practices are impossible to do in traditional food infrastructure setting where there's more one-on-one -on -one engagement with sellers. Now, the next theme is called gifting versus ridding. So according to uh, Gila's food waste regime framework, both food and waste should be understood as social relations, constituting social relations. So, is, so there's judgment behind the scene um, and behind the decision of what is considered food and what is considered waste and what is considered valuable. Um, and Gila also noted that waste is based on the unequal organization of risk and uncertainty. So the ability to shield oneself from risk and to increase another's exposure to them is a key source and result of power. So one thing that I always struggle um, as a scholar also of waste management in both Indonesia and North America is often the focus um, on uh, solutions are on household food waste reduction and tips on household food waste reduction are often copied from a ho household understanding uh, of a Western perspective that is very different from uh, that in Indonesia. So in Indonesia, households are multi-generational, they are more fluid. So um, in my research, I often and unpack, you know, what is really meant by household, as you can see from this quote, with 13 people, you know, um, residing in one household. So in my study, what I found was that sometimes in a household, um, especially with the upper and middle income class communities, when there is a relationship around food sharing, it's usually based on this idea of gifting. So gifting is uh, about gifting something new. So gifting food that is new, even if it can lead to significant waste in the receiving household, as you will see from this quote. So gifting in the upper and middle income uh, class group is a way to nurture social capital, strengthen relationship, and in some cases can be a way to obtain favors. But when it comes to food sharing with the low income community, there's a different relation, um, relationship that come into play. And so that uh, relationship is called ridding. And so um, ridding is basically the act of food sharing between upper and middle to uh, between upper and middle to lower class group, um, usually with domestic helpers, in particular in Indonesia. In a way, domestic helpers or lower lower income people, um, it could be the waste collectors or the security guards outside. They become conduits of disposal by ridding of food, uh, for example, through fridge cleaning or through unwanted leftovers. And one participant noted how um, one upper class participant noted how she received a gift um, from another household of fried traditional delicacies, which was wrapped in newspaper. And when she looked at that, she was really concerned that the ink from the newspaper was carcinogenic. So instead, um, she gave it to, um, to her helper. Um, 
So while it does reduce food from being landfilled, it's important to consider the unequal power dynamic in this practice. And I'm just going to ask for one more minute. Um, and the final theme is the rise of packaging waste. And as Hawkins noted in her seminal work, the rise of the waste crisis in urban governance in the mid 1960s has been directly connected to the proliferation of food packaging. And here's just a picture of individually packaged bananas that I took while I was at a mini market in Indonesia. Can you imagine? It's individually packed bananas. We can get bananas from the tree in Indonesia. Not sure why it's a um, single package. So in Indonesia, before the 1980s, waste management can be done on site and for the most part does not require complex waste infrastructure. However, with the rise of plastic, this has made common practices such as burying waste, composting, or even integrating food waste with food growing in urban centers very difficult. And even traditional foods that were previously wrapped with banana leaves in Indonesia are also now wrapped in plastic, making it even more complex. So um, today, I won't conclude with a list of solutions, but I think it's important to remember that, you know, when we think about waste or circular food economy or economies that design waste out of the system, that was actually in existence in Indonesia. So when I think about innovation, sometimes I, you know, talk to my Indonesian colleagues and I say, you know, think about what all of the intelligence that we had in the past uh, with what we've done before um, and how, you know, um, that, that we should be aware of the, you know, the constant um, way to, uh, the constant solution to like, you know, a technology optimistic solution or solutions that are based on just creating more band-aid solutions that doesn't really get to the deep root cause of uh, the problem. So um, thank you very much. And uh, that's my email. I'm sorry that I went over time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tamara Soma, for that, you know, wonderfully uh, sort of situated vantage point from which you're telling us about these issues, many of which we heard about too from Mr. Von Hernandez. I thought it really dovetailed nicely. Um, without further ado, if um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Leah Zani to um, tell us about the work that, that she does um, in, the, in her context and hopefully also expand, uh, expand our thinking on this conceptually as well. Dr. Zani. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> I'm delighted to be here with such a great group of panelists and I wanna thank the Center for hosting us all and Elisa for moderating. It's a pleasure to meet another anthropologist. <laughs> um, so the prompting question that Elisa sent me prior to this panel was to define waste in my work. And this is the kind of question that anthropologists love. Uh, and it's also a very hard question to answer. Um, particularly in my own work focusing on military waste. Um, military waste is really only a recent phenomenon that people have started to explore and it's there's no real settled definition of what counts as military waste. And it's a very contentious term because to talk about military waste is to immediately put oneself into massive geopolitical situations that are extremely complex, often involving weapons and explosives. So. These are challenging situations to work through. In my own work in Laos, I have a, a basic definition of, of military waste as the remains of war after war ends. So this includes things like minefields and abandoned tanks, cluster munitions that didn't explode during the war, leftover airstrips and other uh, military bases. Um, and in this, this, this is a, a kind of classic definition in um, this people who work in this sector, such as humanitarian explosives clearance workers. And in this, this basic framework, um, these things, these leftover minefields and abandoned tanks are wasteful because they were not used during the war. So they're seen as being an oversight, excessive or accidental. Um, I, I think that this definition is an appropriate place to start a discussion of waste and military waste, but there are a lot of assumptions in this definition that make it problematic. Um, for example, this definition assumes that war is efficient or can be made efficient and that leftover bombs are accident or an accident. Um, when we know from looking at um, military archives from the Vietnam War, where many of these bombs date from, that it was not accidental that these villages were bombed or that these civilians were killed in war. Um, and that the, many of these places were sort of purposefully contaminated with cluster munitions with the intent of hampering the development of a strong society after the war. 
Another assumption in this definition is that it assumes wars have beginnings and ends so that you can clearly identify when a bomb is useful and when a bomb is waste. Um, and that's not how military waste works. Like um, a bomb that explodes after a war ends is just as dangerous as a bomb that explodes while a war is legally occurring. Um, this definition also assumes that civilian violence is accidental. And I don't, particularly when we're talking about the deployment of weapons and explosives, I don't think violence is ever accidental. <laughs> So this is the definition that um, is often used in um, sectors that try to clean up this waste, such as humanitarian explosives clearance. And it's also the beginning that what I began to use when I started doing my research in Laos. So military waste, the remains of war after war ends. Um, but as I began doing my research in Laos in these old battlefields that are still hugely dangerous, I um, came up with two other ways to think about waste, which I'm going to share with you now, because I think it dovetails nicely with the work of our other panelists. Um, <clears throat> the first is to think about waste uh, environmentally, to think about the way that military waste is not only a geopolitical process, but also an environmental process where military waste in particular contaminates massive territories and fundamentally alters the relationships, the social relationships and the environmental relationships of the people who are living in that territory. Um, David Biggs, the panelist who's going to be going after me in his work describes this as militarized landscapes. Um, militarized, militarization is a social process whereby all other social interests are subordinated to military dominance. Uh, America is a massively militarized society. And these former battlefields in Laos are also highly militarized. Even now, half a century after the war ended, these bombs are still here and they still have a huge impact on the way that people live their lives. Um, to, th to think about the role that military waste has in, uh, in changing these social relations and contaminating these environments, I use waste as a verb, as Von Hernandez also does. Um, and I talk about military wasting as a process of degradation that occurs over time, um, of ruination, as these environments are increasingly um, dangerous or risky because the landmines are still there, because the cluster bombs haven't exploded, because the tanks are leaking into the soil. Whatever is going on here, these remains of war continue to waste the environments that they are in. Um, I talk about this in my work as creating bomb ecologies, um, entire social systems that are impacted by the presence of explosives in the soil and in the, the communities that live there. So that's a big deal. And that's a pretty serious thing to talk about. And it I definitely often can be a, a depressing or overwhelming process to study. So I wanna counter that with um, another way to think about waste, which is to think about waste as um, being part of a larger sociocultural process that's bigger than war and, and bigger than the military stratagems that um, leave these bombs behind um, in Laos and in other places. So wasting happens alongside other social processes um, that exceed war. Um, so that means that people are encountering these um, remains of war when they're going about their daily lives. Um, and they're giving these, these things new meaning. They're using them in new ways. And I think this is the, one of the special things about waste in that waste is, it's what's left over. It's what's excessive. And so that means that it's available to be reused, to be recycled, to be remade, to be reimagined. Um, and people do that with even the most dangerous things like a leftover bomb that they find in their rice field. And so this idea that we continue to live our lives and that even something as dangerous as a bomb is part of a larger sociocultural process of people learning how to make meaning out of their daily lives. This to me is the, I something that I find very compelling in my own research in Laos and for thinking about the role of waste in society. 
Um, <clears throat> so I want to give an example, and I have some show and tell props to share very briefly to close out my presentation. Um, I want to give an example of what this looks like in practice, both wasting as a process of slow ruination over time, and also this other sociocultural process of making meaning out of waste, of reusing or reimagining waste. So I'm going to tell a very short story. <laughs> Um, so imagine me, and I'm doing field work, I'm embedded with an explosives clearance team, and on this day I'm shadowing um, a, a bomb technician who is herself Lao and grew up in one of these old battlefields and has been now clearing these bombs out of these fields for, for several years, and I'm shadowing her through her day's work. And we're in a village that um, is a, a focal point for the local metal scrap trade, the war scrap trade. So we know that people in this village are going out into the forests and collecting military scraps, um, old bombs or pieces of tanks or whatever, and they are selling it on the global scrap trade. So we're, we're walking through this village and um, this is a Lao village. So people are building their houses on stilts. and um, usually the garbage is stored on the bottom layer underneath the stilt house or just to the side of the stilt house. So we're walking through this village and we pass by one of these garbage dumps underneath the stilt house. And um, my interlocutor, the bomb technician says, oh, that's a piece of a rocket. And she picks up this, this item. And she says, um, this is a piece of a rocket. And I say, oh, is it safe? And she says, yes, you can take it if you want it. And she hands it to me. So I take this and um, I've just been told it's part of a bomb, but I'm not sure it's actually part of a bomb. And so I show this to other bomb technicians um, and friends and colleagues in Laos. And we decide that it's not part of a bomb. It's actually part of a motorcycle engine which in, in size and function is very similar to a rocket. Let's be serious here. Um, so I, I could have just thrown this away again in the same way that that villager had, but I decided to keep it, even though it is unremarkable. Um, I decided to keep it as a reminder of the role of waste in these villages, as a reminder that it's easy to get distracted by these violent histories of war. And if I get distracted in that way, or if my interlocutor, this Lao technician gets distracted, we can lose sight of what's actually happening in the present moment. That it is really just a piece of a motorcycle engine. It's not a part of a bomb. Um, and just for, I also have, this, this is actually part of a bomb, which another technician gave me. This is part of a rocket propelled grenade, also found in a village nearby. So, they look very similar. <laughs> and I have another thing to show you here, which in um, villages like the one that I was just in where I found that motorcycle, um, piece of a motorcycle, they're collecting waste and um, turning it into um, domestic items. So here's a pair of chopsticks that are made out of scrap aluminum. And these the items like this are, um, used for domestic, just things that you use in your everyday life without thinking about the fact that they're made out of war waste. Um, and they're also sold in tourist economies um, as souvenirs of the war in Laos. So in looking at these, these various items, um, we can see how they have completely different meanings and they circulate through completely different social systems, tourist economies, domestic life. And this is what I mean when I talk about waste having this ability to be restoried, reused, reimagined in different ways in different societies. And I'd like to, to give that, that framework to you and to our panelists as we think about the various roles of waste in Southeast Asia. Um, and I'm going to leave you on that note. And I appreciate your time and attention as I've shared these things with you. And, and I look forward to the rest of our discussion later on and to your questions. Thank you. Dr. Liazani, thank you so much for that really phenomenal and really thought-provoking 
uh, thought-provoking set of ideas from a landscape that's really just so overcome by violence. I imagine that the fieldwork must have been very difficult. So I appreciate, uh, I'm sure we all appreciate uh, uh, just your sharing uh, sharing stories with, with us and sharing objects as well that really um, kind of makes it real for us. Um, and lastly, we'd like to welcome Dr. David Biggs to the floor. Um, I'm sure that uh, Dr. Biggs will also help us kind of expand, continue expanding our conceptual, uh, the, the ways that we're approaching waste conceptually uh, and historically as well. So without further ado, we'll have Dr. David Biggs. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks, Alyssa. W what a wonderful panel. It's my great honor to meet you all, some for the first time. And I'm totally going to borrow from Tam Tamara and wish everyone uh, greetings of peace from Riverside, California, uh, ancestral lands of Kawia, Serrano, Tongva, and Luisinu peoples, uh, also Chimawevi. And, um, and, and I'll, I'll get started here. Um, I'd like to first. Um, just put a little shout out to this book, not because I want you to buy it, but because it's free. Um, the University of Washington, thanks to an NEH grant, uh, offers my book uh, as a downloadable PDF. You can just download it. Nobody will hassle you. Um, and I'm going to um, talk today uh, just simply telling a small story um, with a picture from that book right here. Um, and uh, specifically today, uh, in the little bit of time, I'd like to uh, follow what Leah said, and it's really great to follow Leah um, to, to you know, talk about militarization and what makes something a toxic waste. And I'd like us to think a little bit about the importance of stories and what stories tell us um, about what counts as toxic that involves government action, often massive government action, and what doesn't count. And, and really to think about those boundaries. And I, I love, Leah, your image of those aluminum chopsticks and also the discussions uh, that Tamara and Vaughn had about everyday waste in Indonesia and the Philippines and plastics and thinking about the compound impacts of these little satchels um, and, and what that means globally for, for our uh, future. And, um, and I'm, I'm going to, um, I want I want you to take a look at this picture. This is something I'll be doing actually later today in my uh, world history lecture where we're reading photographs. And what do you see? Well, in this case, you have a little caption, but you see some men, men of different races. They're loading some barrels onto a, a cargo helicopter. Um, this is a shot of the 184th chemical platoon. Um, this is on one of the American bases during the Vietnam War. Um, and maybe if, uh, if you saw those images, and somebody asked me this when we were talking before this started, uh, you might think that those are barrels of Agent Orange. Agent Orange is the defoliant, the herbicide that was sprayed to eliminate forest cover in, in Vietnam. I think most of us, when we think of Vietnam and toxic waste, that's the first thing we think about. Um, in fact, they're loading something quite different. It's called CS2. CS2 is um, the powdered concentrate of tear gas. And um, if you look at the second barrel to the right, you'll see there's a little thing sticking out the top of that barrel. That's actually a fuse made of phosphorus. Phosphorus burns white hot. Um, and that fuse would be lit um, to explode this barrel near the ground. And what these men are doing are loading about 30 of these 55 gallon drums of tear gas into a cargo helicopter. That helicopter is then going to fly low over uh, a site that is um, some battle zone area with underground bunkers and tunnels. And um, all of these barrels will be webbed together and they're going to be dropped out that cargo bay door. And then the fuses will light um, and it will explode powdered tear gas into the tunnels and bunkers of this supposed enemy um, area. 
And what's important about this is that in all the discussions that veterans have had about all of the associations with dioxin from Agent Orange and the health effects, these massive lawsuits, uh, now about $300 million the US government has spent cleaning up dioxin associated with Agent Orange, there's been almost no discussion about tear gas. And um, what, what's interesting about tear gas in particular is that it's incredibly lethal um, especially in this form. The CS2 is designed as a powder that would stick to the walls of tunnels. It wouldn't actually um, turn into a gas immediately on contact with air. And so this was designed to kill people. Uh, it asphyxiated people who are in the tunnels. Um, and when the US forces left the bases very quickly in 1972, there were stockpiles of the CS2 all over the place. Um, some of it got turned over to the South Vietnamese army. Materials that couldn't be stockpiled, the army had a disposal process. Um, the army has a, actually a very thick manual, uh, all the military branches do, about how to dispose of waste. So, for example, burn pits in Iraq and Afghanistan are one way to dispose of waste, also very toxic. But the way to dispose of waste in 1972 for this particular item was to bulldoze it into a ravine and cover it with dirt. And so, um, so this issue um, came to my attention in part because when I started this research years ago, uh, talking to local environmental protection officers and other people in villages, um, I, of course, was asking first about Agent Orange and what do you know about Agent Orange? And all they wanted to talk about was CS. And they said, enough of this Agent Orange business. You guys are freaks about Agent Orange. Um, but what can you tell us about CS? Because we have villagers who are clearing out these ravines, which have, many of them have become reservoirs, and they're, they're uh, cutting into these barrels and then inhaling the CS, which is so caustic, it's burning holes in their esophagus, esophagus sending them to the hospital or killing them. And this is a major problem. The US has done almost nothing to clean it up. And I think this story is important because it illustrates something that's really important in these discussions about waste, which is what counts as a toxic waste globally in very powerful uh, nation to nation negotiations and what doesn't count and why doesn't it count? And this is something that Rob Nixon, when he, in his books, uh, Slow Violence, The Environmentalism of the Poor, he talks about in the context of Bhopal and we think about concentric circles of, the, of victimhood and, and who counts as a victim deserving of support and who doesn't count. And I'd like the audience to think about those concentric circles because I think one of the big challenges in discussing waste and discussing environmental toxicity is really to think about why don't we push those boundaries much further out? How do we push those boundaries further out? And in a sense, the discussion of militarization um, that I bring in this book is, is an attempt to do that too, to get away from exceptionalist thinking, to get away from a particular story that's interesting, let's say to us, to Americans, and let's think about stories that are important to people on the ground, to people in villages in Laos or you know, in, in different classes. Um, and I think that actually is one of the biggest challenges conceptually that we have right now, especially facing this tidal wave of plastics and really a tidal wave of toxics that are permeating uh, so many different environments. So in a way, I think that's to me what is really core is thinking about those stories and how powerful those stories are in shaping our understanding of, of waste. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you so much, Dr. David Biggs. That's just, I mean, that's a really wonderful way to round out uh, the, the panel conversations. And I'm sure we're left with very many questions. We, we all, we've already received uh, a number of them in the Q&A. 
for those um, who are joining us, please feel free to send in, type in your questions as we go along here. I'll be, uh, I'll be doing my best to kind of collate them, uh, try to combine them, uh, especially if they're related, so that our panelists can address them um, and we can get to as many as we as we possibly can. Um, I'd like to start us off with a question that I think addresses. Um, some points that were already raised by uh, Adolisa Weller in, in the Q&A and also Janet Braza. Thank you so much for your questions. Uh, and the question really is, I mean, it seems like the categories that we're operating with, um, there were a number that were already raised, raised, right? So waste, toxics, trash, pollution, garbage, loss, remains, contaminants, plastics, recyclables. These are all different categories that are sort of conflated, that can be conflated with waste or wasted items, um, but they're definitely not synonymous, right? And so one sort of prominent question that's come up in the Q&A is how do these, and that, that our panelists have already started to address is how do these categories and typologies come into play in your work in these par particular social contexts? Um, are there differential definitions of what is waste, what counts, what's part of those, you know, what's what's part of those concentric circles that Dr. Biggs was mentioning? Um, and are there differences across across the region, across the different countries in the region, between urban and rural areas, um, et cetera? So that's kind of a broad and winding question, but uh, the core of it really is, um, yeah, just if we could do a quick review of um, how you're thinking about these categories and conflations and what ought not to be conflated with each other. Shall I? Uh, Please. Um, yes, well, uh, to answer that question, I think uh, I maybe uh, focus on two points here. First is I, I show I've shown the slide about the uh, typical waste composition, uh, for example, right? Uh, and like I said, uh, 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 the other way to look at it is you know some of these materials are actually resources, right? Uh, uh, and if uh, it's the act of mixing uh, the materials, right, that renders uh, the whole thing as waste. Right, and therefore the solutions also uh, would tell us uh, that if you were to organize, uh, for example, uh, a, a model that is focused on source separation uh, uh, into the different categories, and you'll be able to find sensible approaches and solutions. Uh, for example, kitchen waste, uh, uh, organic waste, uh, uh, definitely should go to a composting plant, you know, and service uh, agriculture instead of, you know, being mixed with other stuff because then it becomes a stinking mess. Uh, uh, same with uh, paper, uh, glass. I mean, these are finite uh, uh, resources that uh, if recycled properly would mean less uh, impacts uh, on, ex uh, on the environment, less extraction, therefore less uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, as well. With plastics, though, this is the second point, it's a bit different, right? Because uh, Plastics, uh, not many people know, come from fossil fuels. 99% of plastics are fossil fuel based. And in fact, uh, even with you know, all this discussion about decarbonization uh, in the energy and transport sectors, the playbook uh, for the fossil fuel industry, their plan B is to expand plastics production, right? <laughs> and th this is their savior. And if you look at uh, projection esti growth estimates uh, in the next uh, three decades, uh, the uh, amounts of plastic that will be pumped into the environment will quadruple, right? And plastics are inherently toxic, right? Uh, and because, you know, to give all kinds of qualities and characteristics for different plastic products, they have to use all the stabilizers, uh, endocrine disruptors, persistent organic pollutants. And when you recycle them, talking about recycling, uh, you're actually also recycling the hazard, right? And, and, and then not uh, counting the fact that uh, uh, ultimately, they break down into the environment as microplastics. They contaminate the food chain. They return back uh, uh, to haunt us. <laughs> so uh, what is the solution uh, uh, to that? Uh, for us, in our view, uh, at least uh, the easiest uh, uh, intervention is eliminating uh, uh, what we call the single-use and recyclable plastics, which right now constitute a significant portion, almost 30% of all plastics being produced. 
right? Uh, we recognize there are essential applications of plastics, but toxics is definitely an issue uh, when it comes to uh, plastics. Sorry uh, for a roundabout way of responding to the question. No, it's very clarifying. Yes, Tamara? Yeah, I love uh, Mr. Um, Hernandez's answer. And so I actually want to compliment that because um, increasingly, especially with conversations around food waste um, with policymakers in Indonesia, there is there is a growing trend to frame waste as a resource. And I completely understand the logic and the need for this approach, especially when we're expiring towards you know, a circular food economy. But I think there is an issue of scale that in Indonesia is not being taken into account because I think the way that waste is framed as a resource currently is based on this production Productionist paradigm, um, and 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 this result, um, this will result in approaches that are kind of it's just kind of moving the problem around without looking at the root cause or thinking about prevention. So prevention is almost like not even considered in this case, um, you know, and in some cases we actually need to turn off the tap, you know, like as uh, Mr. Hernandez mentioned. So there's that issue of scale that I think we need to be cautious about when we're framing waste as a resource. That's a wonderful response, David. I think I think also, you know, this is waste is so political. <laughs> it's so political in a household with who's producing it or who's taking out the garbage, but it's so political in a province, in a town, um, in a state. And I think states, that's, you know, most people feel that dealing at the state level is so hard. Um, but in some senses, I think, um, you know, it's, it's really something that has to be addressed in getting, like you mentioned, Tamara, with the productionist aspect. And also, like Bond mentioned, with segregating anthrosols into different categories and things like that. Um, but we have to understand, too, that, you know, states and economic interests and sort of developmentalist paradigms, things like that are really driving these processes. Um, and if you're pushing up against those processes, even if it's model village, that's not using plastics, using compostable materials produced by a local producer, in a sense, what you're doing is putting a little hole in the armor of these powerful corporations. and. You know, I'd love to hear ideas about how, especially say in the Philippines or Indonesia, about how communities are pushing back. I mean, militaries too, of course, they've got guns, they're very powerful. And when militaries take land for this new uh, rocket launch facility in West Papua, you know, equatorial launch facility is going to be a big thing. Um, what kind of agency do people have to? to push back against this. I mean, these models of agency are very important. I would say in Vietnam, you've got bloggers who are environmentalist bloggers. They're getting nine year prison sentences for speaking out about uh, fish kills and toxic waste in these large steel factories. So at some, some level, I think this thinking about how to engage politically is really, and not get killed or imprisoned is really important. Oh, this is such a big and important question. Um, I, I I feel drawn again to share a short story, a very very short story. Um, it, one of the communities that I worked with had been the site of a ground battle, and at the time that I came to this village, there were two tanks that had been abandoned on the outskirts of the village, one on either side of a road. And this is a village where metal is very scarce and money is very scarce. So um, there were there were a lot of economic pressures towards dismantling these tanks and uh, selling them on the, the scrap trade. Um, there was a resident of the village who was a, a veteran of the of the war who wanted to keep the tanks as reminders of the, the historical events and, and of the war itself, because the, this war is often not taught in Lao schools or taught in a way that doesn't actually convey the, the relevance it might have to the people who are living in these former battlefields. Um, and so the villagers came to a compromise. They dismantled and melted down for scrap one of the tanks on one side of the road and left the other one on the other side of the road 
<laughs> and I share this story with you just to illustrate some of the complexities that the, these communities find themselves in and how they negotiate what is waste and what is a resource, what is historically significant, um, and that these are all things that have to be negotiated in daily life. That's a really powerful story. Does anyone else in the, would anyone else in the panel want to speak to this question that uh, David mentioned about, you know, just like models of agency and how locals express, you know, how they engage politically? Yes, uh, I think it was, a, thanks for that, David. It's a, a good question. Um, it's very political issue, uh, waste management. Uh, uh, actually, if you look at the top expenditures of uh, local governments uh, in the Philippines, I suppose that also applies in other uh, countries. The top <laughs> expenditure item is waste management, right? Uh, literally spending billions uh, annually uh, for waste management. The Philippines actually passed two landmark laws right, uh, 20 years ago. One was the Clean Air Act, which banned uh, waste incineration. Uh, and that was because of a citizen-led uh, campaign to really try to move away from this linear model uh, and, 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 and uh, implement zero waste. It was followed by another law called the National Ecological Solid Waste Management Act, which mandates source segregation uh, and, and setting up of material recovery facilities, it's, it's, except that it's, it's 20 year old law, but it's not been fully implemented. But in cities where citizens have uh, led the uh, implementation of the program, you've seen fantastic, amazing results. Like for example, uh, city of San Fernando uh, in central Philippines, which is located the former uh, mil military base, uh, uh, we're confronted with the proposal to put up a, a big landfill and also a, a modern waste to energy uh, uh, incinerator. Instead of uh, they opposed to that, uh, and how they did that was they organized uh, at the community level uh, and and started you know uh, segregation, composting to the point that they were able to divert, let's say up to now eighty more than eighty percent uh, of the materials that uh, were supposed to go to the landfill, diverting diverting that into material recovery facilities, generating livelihood and jobs, and as a result, the city has saved millions of pesos uh, that are now instead being used to support other more important social uh, services. That's the model, right? That's the model where we try to move away from this uh, linear, uh, uh, but it, it needs to be uh, uh, also complemented by other things like plastic bags, because there are stuff in the residual fraction of the waste that uh, you cannot really manage, right? Even you guys in the US, uh, in Europe, you have difficulty managing these types of waste. That's why you're exporting them to Indonesia or Malaysia or the Philippines, right? Uh, otherwise, you know, uh, if, if they were truly recyclable and uh, manageable, uh, they would not be ending in our shores. I, I um, if, if I may, I would like to speak about the dark side of agency because um, Mr. Hernandez talked about the, uh, the the lovely side. And by the way, Canada exported waste to the Philippines, as I'm sure you know, which was oh so embarrassing. Um, but the dark side of agency is, you know, so there's the sachet economy, all of these packaging, the single um, packaging in Indonesia, and and the 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 piece around agency is where the government, you know, when I asked about this issue, the policymakers would say, oh, but we have training for people and people can take these single use sachet and make it into nice little arts and crafts and make little purses out of it. And then, you know, that's kind of their solution. Meanwhile, the law in Indonesia, Indonesia have lots of great laws <laughs> that's just not implemented. So the law actually says that producers are responsible for the cost of managing it uh, and for dealing with it, but yet it's not implemented. So, it, uh, you know, on the other hand, you know, governments are saying like, well, it's up to individuals to get all of these little sachet and then make it into purses or sell it and so it, it's it's you know again like you know these types of band-aid solutions that I'm sure you know many of you have seen or are familiar with and and one of the reasons why uh, uh, this uh, situation persists is because of the money right uh, it's corruption you know uh, at local government level uh, waste hauling uh, waste management uh, I mean that's a top earner for corrupt politicians uh, and if you're a campaigner or a community uh, proposing a landfill, uh, your, your life is in the line. You know, we have many cases of uh, defenders uh, uh, being harassed uh, because, of, uh, because of this. Mm -hmm. 
two really important points to remember on the individualization of responsibility over problems such as problems such as space. I'm really glad that Tamara brought up the point about the, the dark side of agency. Um, I'd like to shift the conversation a little bit to bring up a point, uh, a very fascinating point that Janet Braza brought up in the Q&A. Uh, and they say military waste or substances like CH2 uh, scraps as such as bombshells and bullet shells are mostly copper mixed with iron and they're not toxic to the environment. Nature will consume those kinds of wastes. Sometimes people collect those wastes because it's recyclable. Um, and uh, the reason I think that this is an important, important point, an, an important point of clarification is because of um, a theme that I sensed was coming up in the many of the presentations about waste as a, a, the conceptions of waste as somehow opposed to natural processes. So what is what is considered to be waste is what is not natural, right? Um, do the would the panelists have any thoughts on that specifically, or like to from from the their context of advocacy and research? David? Yeah, this is a, a great question. And, you know, again, this has to do partly with the way the stories that people mm -hmm. tell and that governments tell and that lawyers and courts tell and that money tells um, about what counts. And, um, you know, I with with Agent Orange, for example, this is something I just recently was on a call with um, a producer at NHK in Japan. Um, one of the big uh, chemical corporations there, Mitsui, um, dumped uh, 245T, this is the herbicide that contains dioxin that's in Agent Orange, at 46 different sites, little amounts at 46 different sites in Japan. There are 47 prefectures. These are 46 prefectures. Each one was owned by the Forestry Service. And uh, the producer was saying, well, this is Agent Orange. We're running an Agent Orange story. And I said, no, it's not Agent Orange. This is commercial herbicide. Um, and they said, well, didn't Mitsui make some for Agent Orange? And I said, maybe, but probably not. The truth is that all around the world in the 1960s, people were consuming you know, massive amounts of herbicide for their rice fields and their home gardens and spraying on the roadsides from Japan to the Soviet Union to New Zealand to California. And um, people were getting exposed to dioxin, um, just like they were the veterans were in Vietnam. And in some cases, they were getting exposed to way more dioxin because they were repeatedly in those environments like golf courses in Japan. And it took three different phone calls, two hours each with his producer before he finally came to conceptualize that his story was wrong and that it wasn't an Agent Orange story, but it was a different story. And he really didn't want to drop the Agent Orange story because everybody knows that story. And I, I think that we have a lot of work to do um, as scholars and as activists um, to, to really bring people to this conception about, about waste and, and that waste isn't necessarily bad. Um, it's just that it is, there's a sort of spectrum, right? And, and half-lives and how, th how long things decompose. And, and how they stay in the environment and where they go. Um, and, and, and that I think is a lot of work, but um, yeah. And, and the, but the answer is it's fuzzy, right? There isn't a strict cutoff on what's toxic and what's not. And we all of us have some molecules of 245T or dioxins or paradioxins or you know, polyaromatic hydrocarbons in our bodies um, because we live in the world. Scary, but also just that's the world we live in. Yeah, I, I would also like to take this question and build off of some of the things that other panelists have said. Um, this is the world that we live in, a one that has been subject to massive militarization programs, including the Vietnam War. Um, and I also, I love what Tamara said earlier about defining waste as, a so, as social relations that distribute risk within society. And I think that that is an especially appropriate way to think about waste when you're talking about military wastes. Um, because military waste is a, a, a really obviously risky form of waste. Like we can, 
talk about um, the, the pollution caused by aerosols or, or other things that may um, impact the environment. Um, but I think um, a landmine that's going to be explosive for 350 years until it finally starts decomposing is a particularly obvious form of dangerous waste. And while I, I also really love what David said about waste being both good and bad. Like um, people in Laos that I worked with were uh, choosing to um, pick these wastes out of the soil and reuse them because it, it felt like genuinely the best option for them in the situation that they were in, a key resource of metals and explosives, which they also used for their own domestic use, such as construction projects or clearing fields. Um, but this is a particularly risky kind of waste. And I don't think that people, like back to our, our, our audience member who made that comment um, about being able to pick these materials out of the soil and recycle of them. Yes, that is true, but it's an extremely risky process. And I don't think that people, I, I just really wanna mark that people are put into situations where this is their best option. And that that is a really disgraceful situation. <laughs> And I don't think that this is this is a tenable social situation in which these risks are distributed in this way. Um, so one a super brief story, because I'm an anthropologist and I love stories. Um, in these villages, the, the 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 bombs were often dropped on the mountainsides because that's where they thought the the guerrilla fighters were staying in the forests on the the mountains. Um, now here we are, a half century later. Every monsoon season, the rain brings the bombs down from the mountains and into the rice fields. So when people are planting rice, which they need to survive in their communities, they are encountering bombs every year. They clear the bombs out of the rice fields. And then the next year, the monsoon rains come and bring more bombs down into the rice fields. So this is not a risk that is like one and done, you clear the village and you're fine. No, it's a risk that you encounter year after year after year. Here we are 50 years after the war, these are risks that are still being encountered. I just don't think that that's acceptable in any kind of society that I want to live in. <laughs> Thank you. That was so forcefully argued. Thank you so much. Um, we have another question, uh, this time from our director, Laura Rosek who asks, how effective is the Basel Convention in regulating waste exports, especially when countries like the United States don't really don't participate? It seems that as long as it's financially feasible, high income countries will continue to export plastic waste to low income countries. In essence, the question then is, does the Basel Convention have any teeth? Uh, yes, it's unfortunate that the U.S. is not a party to the uh, to the Basel Convention, but then uh, that makes it illegal, actually, for uh, the U.S. to be sending uh, uh, hazardous waste, including you know what is considered uh, uh, like plastic waste, contaminated plastic waste, to uh, uh, non-OECD uh, member countries. Right, so uh, it is effective. I mean. Uh, uh, we've seen in the 80s and early 90s, not just plastic, but also all kinds of hazardous waste being shipped from uh, uh, OECD to non-OECD countries. For the most part, that practice has stopped, right? It's just that now we're seeing a new generation of uh, uh, waste materials uh, being exported to the developing world uh, uh, in the context or in the guise of uh, uh, recycling, and we've exposed the myth that uh, these materials are actually being recycled or managed responsibly, right? So, uh, so yes, so even if the U.S. is not a party, it tries to undermine uh, agreement uh, uh, at that level, it tries to broker uh, so-called bilateral deals with other countries, you know, dangling some uh, aid uh, uh, also as part of that, uh, uh, and it tries to uh, uh, undermine, but the EU, for example, also part of the OECD club, uh, 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 for the most part, uh, they subscribe and they support uh, the agreements uh, in Basel. So, uh, and that is the dynamic that you know we've been trying to also leverage and take advantage of. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, uh, the US uh, is already it's a red flag, you know, when the shipments from the US. Uh, 
uh, and for the, for example, in the Philippines, we've stopped uh, receiving those types of shipments already. Although they make they may come in illegally, they declared illegally, not as plastic, but something else, uh, for example. So it still happens, uh, subterfuge. Um, I think I think tied to that, um, I would say that you know the concept that I mentioned around distancing um, actually um, helps explain the complexity around the monitoring, the auditing, and the implementation of Basel Convention because. The obfuscation um, and the lack of transparency is purposeful because waste trade is very complex. And as Mr. Hernandez mentioned, you know, you know, these are the, the these wastes are exported under the guise of recycling, or that these are you know um, resource. And then once you open it, it turns out it's it's like it's toxic, you know, diapers and all of these other things. So I think I think when when we think about that distancing process, um, you know, the the opposite would be to really think about how do we create closed loop cities. Closed Loop, you know, um, communities, uh, you know, where where things are circular um, instead of linear, like how it is right now. Yes, David. Yeah, I'd like to follow Tamara's point about distancing, and I think we can, um, you know, even do a couple little exercises as a group here and think about the stories that we're telling and where we are talking about and how. You know, if you think about um, plastics and pollute and toxics, heavy metals, we're in it at this very moment. I mean, I'm working off of a laptop with five different precious earth, you know, heavy metals that are really major components of the circuit boards. Um, how many of us touched something plastic today in the last, you know, six hours? Um, we don't really know where those poly aromatic hydrocarbons came from in the earth. The people who are involved, you know, these waste streams, um, you know, are are really global, and um, and they're so woven into our everyday lives. It's impossible. At least we didn't get on airplanes, you know, <laughs> and add five tons of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. But you know, that in a sense it has always been the case. This sort of micro level of interaction, but also the global level, um, and again, just. Thinking about military bases, I make a point in the book that a military base is an industrial park in reverse, in the sense that military bases take manufactured goods and often deploy them into remote, remote areas that are battle zones um, and blow things up and leave that waste. Um, but how many of us got an Amazon shipment in the last week? <laughs> you know, those industrial parks, those export processing zones, and it's not a coincidence that they're built on top of former military bases from the 1960s to the 1980s, because those places are perfectly suited. They're already toxic in a lot of ways. Um, so I think that that kind of rethinking is really important. I think scholars have a really important role to play in in really boosting that rethinking of, of of that and last thing i'll say is that i think time is really important um, we haven't talked much about time or temporal frontiers but in a sense waste problems all of these problems we're thinking about are not just spatial in terms of that landfill over there or that village's problem but they're really really temporal too I'd like to maybe pick up on a point that um, David just mentioned right now. Um, there's been a lot of emphasis on the role that scholars uh, and, and researchers might play in expanding kind of the ways we think about these issues. Um, can I just ask like very, in a point blank way, like what are, what openings are there for scholars and academics? I mean, sorry, academics and practitioners to work together on these work related issues. I, I think that there's a, an incredible need for um, collaboration around these issues precisely because categories like waste, as we've been discussing in this panel, are, are very politically contentious and can be very difficult to identify. Um, and I think all of our panelists have used uh, studies and survey data and qualitative interview data in order to make the case for certain kinds of waste management or waste reduction. Um, and so those are the kinds of collaborations that really need to take place. 
I think, so that's like one thing that we can do. And then one other thing I wanna briefly say is also helping us rewrite the narratives of how we identify waste and, and what counts as waste. Um, like, uh, the, and then very briefly in my own work, my, my own soapbox for this is the way that um, explosive accidents are discussed after war where the, 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 the common phrase for this is an unexploded, um, <clears throat> an unexploded ordnance accident. <clears throat> so there are a lot of problems with this phrase. And as an anthropologist who pays attention to the power relations that um, are created by the language that we use to talk about violence, um, I, when I work with clearance technicians, I really try to pinpoint the power relations that are created by this phrase and how we can use different language. So for example, um, not referring to these explosions as accidents because this kind of violence is not accidental. These weapons were designed to kill people and that is what they are doing. Um, and cluster munition um, ordinance contamination in particular is known to have high civilian casualty rates. And when you deploy it, when the United States deployed it, it is intended to have these long-term effects in times of peace. Um, so just like simple things like that, like I think as an anthropologist, I can come in and say, hey, let's not talk about these things as accidents because it's diminishing of the, the, the real violence and suffering of this phenomena. And it perpetuates a political dynamic that makes the US look less culpable. So that's just one example of what a scholar can add to these discussions. I'll just add a little thing. I know I'm out of turn, but I, I think also, you know, we have to think about failures of imagination. Um, and, and, and in a sense, what our problems are here are failures in imagination. Um, and some, some fiction writers have talked about this as well in terms of how do you encompass these often tragic, you know, experiences or these in, in, in writing and stories and agency and, you know, what, you know, what counts as a good story. Um, and I think that scholars have a really important role to play in maybe shifting some of the theoretical frameworks as well that we use in our different disciplines in history and anthropology and other fields. Um, and, and using those different frameworks as different ways of valuing, you know, because I think, I think a lot of our frameworks really still center around states and they still center around sort of Marxist ideas of production and modes of production and developmentalist stages and, and, and things like that. So I think they're not immediate fixes. I mean, I don't think academics are ever, I mean, they can barely change a light bulb, but um, you know, um, I think that imagination is, is really important. If I may, I'd like to steal that uh, <laughs> phrase, very nice, uh, uh, failure of imagination. Right, because uh, for me, waste is a failure of imagination, right? Because if you're thinking about waste as a, a, a sign of inefficiency, it's a design issue, right? What we want is really challenge our engineers, challenge our producers to design waste out of the system. Uh, in other words, uh, our message to industry and producers should be, if we cannot reuse or we cannot recycle safely, minus the toxics, your products, you should not be producing them in the first place, right? Uh, this uh, and instead, you know, invest in uh, what we call uh, alternative uh, modes of delivering products to market to people. Uh, in the case of consumer uh, goods companies, uh, uh, investing in reuse or refillable systems. Those systems have been in place, you know, uh, in our societies uh, before, right? It's just that uh, we've been overwhelmed uh, with too much uh, plastic uh, linked to this pathological pursuit of profits on the part of the fossil fuel uh, companies and their affiliates, right? So it's hard to get out of that linear model, but we need to be making uh, drastic changes now. Uh, if we were to avert, you know, the twin catastrophes of uh, climate change and plastic pollution. Sorry, again, if I can just add briefly, I, I think that, you know, recognizing indigenous claims like Tamara did, indigenous land claims and indigenous forms is also a really effective way of pushing back against other story frameworks that often are allied with waste. Thank you so much. Oh, we're, um, we're just, 
Oh, go ahead. I was going to invite everyone to have um, invite everyone on our panel to have uh, their last the to share a, la a last set of ideas or words or thoughts for us. And we're just at time, but um, I'd like to give you all the floor to just um, to deliver a, a last message if you'd like. Thank you so much. And so this will be my my last comment. And I think, you know, sometimes with the narrative of imagination, um, especially in countries like Indonesia, is that there's this push for, you know, increasing GDP and for growth and development and modernization. And, you know, um, and I, I actually look back to the stories and the traditions and the cultures of, you know, my my people from the Sundanese people of West Java and, and also the tale of the crying rice, which is a tale shared by my mom, that really reminds, you know, uh, our people, especially of our connection to rice, to the farmers, to the land, to the water, and how food is so imbued with identity and spirituality. And these traditional tales are actually a reminder how wasting, according to our cultural tradition, is, is something that is worth crying over. And I don't think that that type of narrative, I think it's often important for us to remember and remind ourselves of that narrative, of that imagination, you know, uh, of not just like going along with, with the you know, with the, with the flow that is not necessarily leading to uh, good outcomes in, in my country. Thank you. That's a beautiful thought to leave us with. Can I invite any of the other panelists? Yes, I want to build on the focus on imagination, which I also love. Um, and I think that waste, because it is this remainder that is then available for reuse, to be remade or recycled or to be reimagined. I think this is kind of the, the hopeful part of talking about waste is that we're talking about things that are kind of inherently available to be reimagined. And uh, this is one of the reasons that I use creative research methods uh, like poetry and art. Um, and so I just wanna I <laughs> do a slightly selfish thing and end by plugging my next book, Strike Patterns, which is actually a novel, a hybrid memoir based on my research in Laos. Um, so if anybody wants to explore how I've used creative methods to reimagine waste, that novel Strike Patterns is out in March from Stanford University Press. We absolutely cannot wait for that. And everyone in the audience should absolutely get a copy. I'm sure it'll continue to spark the imagination for sure. Um, the other panelists? I, I talk too much. I'll, I'll, I'll just say, I, you know, I really encourage all of us to find opportunities to talk to indigenous peoples in the places where we are, because I think that's one really powerful way to think about new ways of imagining how we connect to land. And I think that's why native land acknowledgements are important, even if it's just sort of a thing you do um, these days. Um, and uh, and also I end, I end the Footprints of War book with uh, a series of, with a group of relatives, some of my in-laws coming together over building an ancestral shrine. And this is a different way of, of connecting to land. And um, it's a family that was divided by the war on both sides of the war. And people have a hard time talking about war, um, but they don't have a hard time talking about ancestry and, and the ways that it anchors them in a particular village or land. And I, I think those are really important forms and in ways that anybody, even if you don't feel connected to where you are, um, or in you know Southeast Asia or wherever, those are ways of of fostering that reimagination. Definitely, um, building those connections is the is a response to what Tamara has been re reminding us of this distancing effect. But um, let me hand the floor over to Mr. Von Hernandez for for his last thoughts. Not not much more to add, uh, actually. Uh, but yeah, just to say that uh, uh, the future uh, of you know pollution, uh, waste uh, crisis is these these are not inevitable, right? Uh, and again, it's all also down to us uh, uh, to uh, be able to affect uh, the systemic changes required because uh, there's a lot of you know false narratives and myths being propagated out there uh, by. Uh, in particular, by an industry that's trying to, you know, survive uh, uh, and 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 uh, still make us dependent on them. It, this this issue of plastic pollution, in particular, is a supply-driven issue. It's not uh, we've been mesmerized into thinking that this is fault of consumers, uh, uh, but actually we have to uh, 
upend that, you know, and 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 really look at who's uh, the accountabilities and the liabilities uh, behind this. And people are fighting back, uh, as we've seen with the uh, climate crisis. Thank you again for this opportunity. And thank you so much to all of our panelists for just this incredible conversation that a really moving and powerful conversation that we've just had. Thank you for expanding our imaginations, encouraging us to uh, just deconstruct the, the, oper the operating, like the operative categories that we have in our minds. Um, thank you also for, you know, reminders of the power of individual agency, but at the same time, uh, you know, powerful reminders about holding the power, holding the powerful accountable and recognizing how violence is distributed, not only spatially, but also temporally. And, you know, um, the power of stories also in, in sort of disturbing, uh, disturb, disturbing easy narratives about this, especially in, in this region that we all care about is Southeast Asia. So thank you all so much for, for, you, for all that you've given us to think about and to work on uh, today. We really appreciate your time and thank you all to the audience for being here and for making this conversation the dynamic conversation that it is. Thank you, everyone, and a hand to Elisa, who put together such a fantastic panel. The more we talk about this, hopefully the more will be done. So thank you, everybody, and have a great weekend.